We still have a few people coming in, but I think we'll get started. I'm Gaylord Torrance, Fred and Virginia Merrill, Senior Curator of American Indian Art here at the Nelson Atkins. I'd like to welcome you today. We have with us five scholars regarded internationally as the preeminent leaders in the field of American Indian studies. Their accomplishments, both individually and collectively, are, are simply extraordinary. All have curated, published, taught, and in some cases exhibited in distinguished institutions throughout North America and Europe, perhaps beyond. All have received numerous honors for their work, and all have been central to our current understanding of Plains Indian art. Emil, Castle, and Christian were part of our original planning forum for Plains Indians at the very outset, and Arthur and Emma entered the project as important native voices during the course, and you will see um, many of their statements on text panels throughout the exhibition. Everyone here was a contributor to the catalog. I'm going to keep my introductions brief so that we have some time for discussion, otherwise there would be none. And I'll begin with Arthur Amiot, who is Aglala Lakota. Arthur is one of the most renowned American Indian artists working today, as well as a senior educator, scholar, writer, lecturer, and consultant to museums. He's also a traditional man, widely and greatly respected for his depth of knowledge regarding Lakota spiritual art and artistic traditions. His most recent exhibition was a retrospective organized this year by his native South Dakota State Historical Society. He's one of the two principal essayists in the catalog for the Plains Indians. He's the one that wrote about the art. And one of his works is included in the exhibition. Christian Feist is former director of the Wildt Museum Wien in Vienna and former professor of ethnography of indigenous America at Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main in Frankfurt, Germany. His book, Native Arts of North America, published in 1980, quickly assumed prominence as a standard in the field of American Indian art history, both here and in Europe. And it remains so today, more than 30 years later. Christian's subsequent record of leading scholarship, publications, and exhibitions is one of the most extensive and remarkable in both range and quality. Emma Hansen is a Pawnee heritage. She's curator emerita and senior scholar of the Plains Indian Museum of the Buffalo Bill Center for the West in Cody, Wyoming. It was there that she conceived and directed an award-winning reinstallation and reinterpretation of the Plains Indian Museum's extensive collection. She's contributed essays to numerous publications over the last 20 years, and her recent book, Memory and Vision, tells an especially compelling story of the arts, cultures, and lives of Plains people from a distinctly native viewpoint. And in that regard, it's a singular and important contribution to the field. Emil Hermini Horses is Aglala Lakota. Emil is a highly accomplished traditional artist working primarily in bead and quill work and former director of the Butchell Museum on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. He's now associate curator at the National Museum of the American Indian where he's produced two important exhibitions during the last decade, Song for a Horse Nation, which examined Plains Indian arts associated with the horse, a remarkable topic needing to be explored for a long time, and Identity by Design, Change, Tradition, and Celebration in Native American, in Native Women's Dresses. Emil is widely sought after as a consultant to museums throughout the world and a contributor to planes, to museum projects um, equally as much throughout the country. Castle McLaughlin is curator of North American Ethnology at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, Harvard University. Castle is an anthropologist. I keep telling her that she keeps slipping into the realm of art history in spite of herself. But actually her work over, over the past two decades in particular uh, embodies the interdependent relationship between these two, two disciplines that form a part of what we know about Indian art and culture, and they're joined, of course, by the indigenous body of knowledge that has come down to us through time. 
in her landmark study, Arts of Diplomacy, Lewis and Clark's Indian Collection. It set a new standard, both in our understanding of the native objects associated with that expedition, but also uh, as an unprecedented in-depth examination of historical American Indian works of art. Her most recent book, published just last year, a Lakota war book from the Little Bighorn, has redefined the way we now see and understand the great 19th century tradition of Plains Indian drawings on paper. Please join me in welcoming our guest to Kansas City. And before we begin our presentations today, I want to say something about the title. Um, everything we know about Plains Indian art, it, it's ridiculous, of course. Um, because first of all, there's not nearly enough time in this afternoon for our panelists to even begin to touch upon the depth of knowledge that they possess. But it also suggests something that the knowledge of Plains Indian art is still incomplete, it's still evolving. We're each of us going to focus on a variety of issues today, or I should say we're each going to focus on a variety. You know what I mean. Uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to talk about a lot of things. And um, uh, some of us will talk about the artists, techniques, meanings um, uh, associated or embodied in this work. Uh, others are going to perhaps delve into other issues. Um, and following our individual presentations, if there's time, we're going to accept questions. Uh, from you, the audience, and respond as a group. And um, towards the end of the presentations, some of our staff will be handing out these cards and pencils, and uh, if you have a question, we invite you to write them down. Um, they'll be given to me, and we'll, we'll uh, take up whatever time we have left. So with that introduction, uh, please join me in welcoming Kristen Feast. Good afternoon. First of all, let me thank Gaylord Torrance and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art for both having this exhibition, this seminal exhibition on Plains Indian Art, and for also having this Scholars' Days and this meeting today, which brings together some of the people that have worked together to make, make the catalog. And for you as the audience, of course, the exhibition is, is the major thing. For me as a scholar, the catalog is the thing that will remain. And, um, so therefore, uh, it's something that, uh, that we, all, we all are very proud of, even though we um, are aware of the fact that while we are hopefully uh, placing a landmark in the study of Native American art in 2014, uh, maybe a decade or so uh, from now, this will be old-fashioned and uh, new knowledge will have come up and will have superseded what we know today. My, my remarks will be directed uh, in part um, on these questions, on questions of uh, knowledge and how knowledge is created and uh, how we as, as scholars f uh, always fight against certainties, uh, fight against the assumption that we know everything. Now, um, again, um, if you ask me um, if, if I know everything about Native American art, despite of what uh, Gaylord has said about my career, I should say I know very little about Native American art and about Plains Indian art in particular. Um, but it's partly based, of course, uh, on, the, uh, on the division of knowledge between a large group of, of scholars in the field that we approach something that is getting close to everything we know today about Native American art. You might uh, wonder why uh, a person like myself from Europe should be regarded uh, as a specialist in Native American art. And there, are, there are two answers. One general answer is, of course, that in today's world of shared knowledge, it's not necessary to be a local uh, of a place uh, to be a specialist of something. The best books about uh, the Nazi period in Germany were not written by Germans, but by Americans and British historians, for example. And um, so, even though I'm not saying that my, my books are the best about Native American art, still it gives me an outside perspective. The second um, uh, answer to the question is that when I decided, back in the 1960s, uh, to devote myself to 
Native American art and uh, cultures. I asked myself, what are you doing here? Uh, how, how, how do you dare uh, even to think that you could compete with your American colleagues who are close to uh, all the materials and, of course, to Native peoples themselves? And this was at the time in the 1960s when it was still difficult to imagine uh, that you could fly from one continent to the other. Times have passed quickly. Um, but then I decided that I should focus on things that were close at hand in Europe. And I was devoting my attention to early collections, collections that were brought to Europe before collecting began in this country, systematic collecting began in this country. And the first collection um, in this country um, that continues to this day was established in 1799, but most of the collecting was really done only in the late 19th century. Well, in Europe, uh, collecting of Native American artifacts started much earlier basically at the time of first contact, and continued more or less until the 19th century when competition from American museums became so strong that European museums gave up on collecting more or less. Even though, like in my case, when I was in Vienna, I continued to collect contemporary material because I thought that uh, as a museum we are collecting uh, the past of the future, which is today, um, and so uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, exclusively focused in my interest on, on the past, but the past, like the 17th and 18th century, is where I claim to have some expertise, uh, limited as it is, and this is where I will, um, what I will focus on in my remarks. The, 16th, the, the, the early period um, plays an important role in the exhibition as well here, because while the, the whole story of Plains Indian art unfolds in the 19th and 20th century, it is based, of course, on things that occurred before, uh, things that occurred in the, in the 16th and 17th century, in the time when the horse was introduced, when people moved into the plains, when the plains became um, what we know them from the 19th century. And of course, it's also based on uh, what happened before first contact with Europeans, uh, with indigenous developments of, of arts and culture in the time before the European arrival. So the two subjects, like archaeology and uh, early history, 16th, 17th, 18th century, um, are subjects that I will be addressing shortly. There are similarities also really in, um, in the methodology in uh, looking at um, archaeological pieces and pieces that were collected and came to Europe um, before, uh, say, 1800. In that, uh, in archaeology, uh, we find artifacts uh, which are not associated with any living culture. There's no living context. We don't know what these things are used for. We can only guess what, what, uh, how they were used for using analogy. Uh, we can also only guess what uh, they meant at the time. Um, the, the spiral pipe here um, is, a, is an example. Um, if you read the catalog, you will find a long exposition on, uh, on the meaning of the pipe, which is interpretation, which is based on uh, iconographic similarities um, across um, large parts of Eastern North America at the time, um, and then using historical um, traditions uh, to interpret these prehistoric uh, artifacts which is fine, but uh, underlying, underlying this interpretation is comparison, which is uh, the mother of all knowledge, so to speak, and uh, comparison is what I, I will be focusing on. On the basis of iconographic comparison, it is possible to say that uh, this pipe uh, from Spiro Mount in uh, Oklahoma um, is an indication for the, the network existing between ceremonial centers uh, all over Eastern North America, maybe centered right here in Cahokia, uh, St. Louis area, um, and um, bringing together um, peoples of different ethnic origin, likely. Again, archaeological artifacts have no ethnic tag on them. Um, and illustrating the spread of ideas and styles uh, in a period before European contact and, and showing that uh, history uh, as something that changes people's conditions and lives. It's not something that occurred only after European contact, but before. Um, the scholarship um, also means uh, sometimes uh, turning things uh, up on its head. And so if you, oh, somebody, maybe I, that's interesting, yeah? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, I, I put these pictures last night when I came in from the airport. Uh, so uh, um, 
but this you, you have seen this already on, on the on the title of the this um, event this afternoon this uh, famous uh, rope um, from French collections um, it is one of uh, four robes that uh, were rescued from the king's uh, cabinet of curiosities at the time of the French Revolution. There were six robes at the time which were attributed to the Illinois people. Um, and only four remain, and we don't know really whether the four that remain are identical with the six that were recorded in 1793. We simply assume that they were. This is a kind of a given, and it's um, not unlikely that uh, they actually came from the Illinois or were, uh, were acquired at a trading point uh, where the, in the Illinois um, and others uh, frequented at the time. Um, as I said, um, comparison is the, is the mother of knowledge, uh, and turning things up on, on the head uh, also might help sometimes. Um, so, um, by uh, coincidence, fairly recently, the last 20 years, um, one other painted height, deer height, has turned up which iconographically is closely related to this one. In a small museum in, in south um, eastern France, in Besançon, it is this one. And I'm turning this on the head now. Um, because then there is a discussion on um, how this should be displayed, and uh, where is top and where is bottom. These things have not no clear instruction, in, like a packing label where it says top and bottom. Um, all we can do is... Uh, Compare compare height paintings from the 18th century to height paintings from the 19th century. Uh, in height paintings of the 19th century, largely bison heights uh, painted by women uh, with uh, abstracted or geometric uh, motifs, uh, the head side is always to the left. If you uh, if you uh, point this uh, point the head side to the left here, uh, the bird. The bird figure will be head down. This is this didn't. Li Some people don't, don't like this, and they have um, exhibited it like it's here. Here is shown with head up. It's easier to recognize. My point, nevertheless, that it's um, probably the incorrect way of showing it, um, and that it should be head down. Um, this is. These are the four surviving uh, heights, uh, and stylistically. Um, they are very similar, maybe except for the one on the lower right, which is a different style, uh, indicating that at those um, trading centers, um, maybe artifacts of, of different people were also traded. Um, but uh, the one on the top left, uh, which is shown here in the exhibition, is the only one that has a recognizable uh, representation of something, even though the others show elements, like the feather elements, um, in uh, various arrangements here, which is again very reminiscent uh, of uh, 19th century Plains Indian painted heights, where uh, you have uh, something that originally may have been representational, completely dissolved into, um, into uh, okay, here is my comparison um, between the two now, um, into uh, design elements. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry about the picture on the right being in uh, black and white only, but there still isn't a good uh, color image of this very significant piece which was collected by uh, Maximilian Prince of Wheat among the Mandan in 1833-1834. And it's uh, what is in scholarship known as a box and uh, border type of rope. Um, where the border, however, in this case, with otherwise, is purely geometric, approaching the kind of geometric borders uh, of the, those so-called Illinois ropes, is clearly discernible as a bison. Yeah? Uh, so, again, here you have a representational design um, that ultimately is dissolved um, into abstraction and abstracted elements that stand for something, with perhaps even the original meaning getting lost. These um, box and border um, heights are generally associated with the earth, that is with the buffalo, with the bison. Um, but uh, it was not necessary uh, to depict the bison anymore. The, the symbols alone would also be sufficient. Um, 
the, the, the catalog also asks the question, or Gaylord's entry to the catalog asks the question of whether this was done by women and men. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that it's uh, women's work. There's no reason. Stylistically, again, um, these uh, early heights uh, have many similarities in the way that uh, negative space is used, for example, in uh, the, the, the way the borders are constructed. Um, that is very typical of, of women's work, not just the abstraction, but very specific elements. So. Um, just by looking at these things, I, I wanted to point out that uh, there are still questions to be asked, that um, there may be discussion and dissents even uh, over uh, details, um, and that you shouldn't really believe everything that uh, we take for granted today, um, but should come back to the next exhibition, uh, hopefully soon, uh, to see what we have learned since this exhibition, uh, which has placed its mark on, on the world of Plains Indian art already. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. You got too soon, too soon. One more thing. <laughs> One more thing. Um, you know, the, again, uh, even the catalog uh, says uh, this is a Thunderbird. And it was called a Thunderbird in the 1930s when it was first published in France. Uh, and because everyone thought that the, the Thunderbird was the bird of the plains. But it's not a Thunderbird, it's not an eagle. Yeah, it's clearly not an eagle, and sometimes it helps uh, to know something about zoology. Um, and if you look at the images more closely, uh, it's a woodpecker, um, and it's quite clearly indicated in the drawing that it's a woodpecker, uh, and it's not, it's not a thunderbird. So in my interpretation, really, and uh, this is my final word here, um, it's, uh, it's a woodpecker descending from the sky. Yeah? Um, Okay, so uh, you have already given me a pause. That was it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Castle McLaughlin, and I'd like to thank you for coming and also to commend Gaylord and all the people that have worked on this um, amazing international installation. We're going in a kind of chronological order with regard to objects. Um, and so I was thinking about what we know and don't know because there are so many things that are still unknown about the early materials, the older historic materials, the further back you go, the less we understand them. Um, and I'm glad that Christian mentioned or showed the, um, did the whole rift on the interpretation of those painted hides. Um, because one of the things I really like about Gaylord's entries for the catalog is that they pose so many questions and um, he articulates um, a lot of areas that um, we still need to learn about. So the few, ob the couple of, the two objects that I was assigned to speak about are representative of uh, things made before 1850, uh, which are relatively rare in American institutions. Um, there are more of those in Europe, perhaps, than there are here. And both of the objects that I'm going to speak briefly about come from the uh, Lewis and Clark collection, quote unquote, at my institution, the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. That uh, is a collection that I had the privilege of working on for seven years. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, focused on during the very um, multifaceted research that we did to identify which objects really could be associated with Lewis and Clark and try and determine their tribal affiliations Etc. was to really to do a lot of materials analysis uh, in terms of identifying the materials used in the creation of, of the objects. Uh, so this is, is a dress from that broad collection, although I think it's probably was collected more like 
in the 1830s by a relative of William Clark. And another thing I just want to point out about the Lewis and Clark collection in general is that I think they were rather unusual as collectors because I don't think that they really, um, they were not proto-ethnographers and they did not set out to collect certain things. I think most of the things they brought back were given to them in diplomatic exchanges or traded to them. Uh, so really the native people had agency in that. And another thing that, uh, well, one of the observations um, that uh, became uh, one of the points that was really clear from working on that early collection, so Lewis and Clark traveled between 1804 and 1806, is that... Um, <sighs> We don't really have a representative sample of Native American material from the 19th century. And even if you look at the exhibit here, you'll find that there are certain tribal groups and certain forms that predominate. So there are many things that have been lost. Many groups are not represented in the record, so to speak. Many forms are not represented, and that's a handicap in terms of trying to understand the origins and continuity. Um, but, and there are a lot of factors that that absence reflects a lot of things, including the particular histories of certain tribal groups and um, collectors' choices. And also, um, Christian mentioned comparison as the mother of all knowledge. Um, and it's true that most curators, uh, if they have an object and they're trying to understand um, who made it, what time period it comes from, and so forth, they generally look in the literature and find similar things. And the problem with that is that there are so many mistakes in the literature. And this is because um, people that wrote early on, you know, before the internet, before um, there were planes even, had a very limited experience for the most part with a, maybe they knew the objects in their collection and some other things in the region and that was a handicap that we don't have today but also there's it's just the case that once something is published it's almost impossible to get rid of. So I remember um, one of my professors in graduate school um, by the name of uh, Freed, Professor Morton Freed, an anthropologist, said you can't kill a bad idea. And it's kind of true. So if someone publishes a photo of an object and says it's a Mandan shirt, and then someone has something similar, they will just call it a Mandan shirt. Um, so I was very fortunate to be able to spend the length of time that I was given to work on the Lewis and Clark collection. And also, um, narratives about things, what's written about them, how they're understood, the meanings that are assigned to them, change over time, they're very they may change with context, whether something's being exhibited in an art museum or an anthropology museum, for example. Some people uh, take a very broad contextual approach to things. Others may uh, be very closely focused on an individual or the culture. So this particular dress, the style, uh, is called a sidefold style. It was a uh, there are only eight or nine surviving examples, I believe, of this dress. And they're not well understood in terms of the origins or um, were these, uh, many of them come from Lakota people, uh, but we don't know how widespread they may have once been. They seem to have been, the style seems to have been obsolete almost um, by the time Lewis and Clark traveled in the very early 19th century. Um, and again, I believe this as dress was probably brought back, uh, collected by a man named Hutter in the 1830s. So what do we know about the artist? Well, my approach to this dress 
has been to um, consider it sort of a, a statement about emerging globalization on the plains. And uh, because as a curator, I always feel a tremendous responsibility to the people that made things and to try and uh, understand what significance the materials had for them, I have found if uh, looking at the materials to be a really good way to try and sort of reconstruct the gestalt of the time period. So this particular dress is uh, fabulous in many ways, but one of its outstanding characteristics is that it, um, the lady who made it used materials from all around the world. So this is just one side, but we can see here the glass beads from China and Italy. There are brass buttons on the top which come from uh, vests. Uh, those buttons are made in England at the very beginning of industrialization. Um, it's also got beautiful quill work with um, indigenous dyes on the front panel, tinkling cones on the bottom. And just a note on the blue beads, when Lewis and Clark traveled, they found blue beads to be in demand the entire length of, of their trip from the Missouri River all the way to the Pacific Coast. So while we may not be able to uh, discover the personal identity of the lady that wore this dress, I think we can tell something about her from its combination of traditional um, cultural materials and patterns. The design is in uh, She's using materials from around the world and reconfiguring them in a, into traditional patterns. And my speculation uh, when we did the Lewis and Clark project is that the lady that owned this dress could have been the wife of a trader on the plains. And partially that idea was inspired by the fact that George Catlin, the artist who traveled on the plains in the 1830s, drew a portrait of a lady named Sandbar, who was Lakota, and she was married to a trader. And the dress she wore in the portrait was covered with these brass buttons and some of the same beadwork pattern. And that um, invokes the really important role of women, not only in terms of material and artwork, uh, which Emma is going to talk about in a minute, but also their role um, in sort of reconciling uh, culture change from marrying traders and um, creating the first generations of mixed blood people. The second object is a pipe. Lewis and Clark brought back more pipes than any other single kind of object, and I believe they acquired these in the course of diplomatic exchanges with tribal leaders, um, during which they entered into relationships of mutual obligation. Thomas Jefferson kept a number of these on his wall back at Monticello, and I believe the tribal leaders wanted to, they're making the point to remember them with uh, the kind of um, generosity and consideration that they showed in hosting Jefferson's representatives, these 30-some people that traveled with Lewis and Clark. And again, um, I think I was supposed to talk about a different pipe, um, a different Calumet. Well, the one with the blue tape on it, though, is the one in the... But at any rate, um, the feather fans, there are three of these in the collection. And um, just, I guess, as an example of early, before 1850 materials, um, we see the style of calumet or ceremonial pipes across a wide uh, area of the plains. Um, and it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint the um, tribal attributions or origins of them because of the stylistic similarities. 
Um, and in general, that's true. So you see tribal styles developing uh, strongly, more strongly after about 1850. Uh, but the pipe I was going to talk about had a lot of trade materials on it. This one has fewer. It's more um, indigenous materials, and it has a duck scalp. Um, the pigments on the eagle feather fan are native pigments, and lots of beautiful quill work, um, which is kind of the quill work in the Lewis and Clark collection is very interesting in and of itself because it's uh, the palette and the techniques used and the forms that were used again uh, in encompass a wide range geographically and there's sort of a foundation for what comes next. My final object in, in closing is a contemporary piece. Um, we were asked to sort of speak about the artist. What do we know about the artist? Well, this is a contemporary artist that I've worked with um, on in several projects, Butch Thunderhawk from Standing Rock. And this is um, a horse effigy stick. Um, I wanted to show it because it relates to another horse stick that I believe um, is going to be discussed in a few minutes. And also because it illustrates sort of um, how certain forms continue and are selected. Things uh, relating to horses have experienced a resurgence of popularity in the last 20 years or so. And I think Butch is fairly typical of a lot of contemporary um, Plains artists in that he's about 70. He was raised by his grandparents. Lakota was his first language. His uh, grandparents on both sides were artists um, who sold their things at the rail railroad depot in Mandan, North Dakota. He learned a lot from them, but he also went to art school in California for a year. And he is related, descended from no two horns, Joseph No Two Horns, who carved the stick used as a kind of logo for this exhibit. And he asked permission from the family to continue this tradition, but he also studied the No Two Horns carvings in the collections of the State Historical Society in North Dakota. And that is another role that um, the early model, the early materials play is they become resources and models for um, contemporary artists who may not necessarily want to replicate them, but who want to continue to um, connect with the ways that traditional um, values and ideas were visualized in forms um, and kind of take off from there. So one of the things that we did during the Lewis and Clark project, uh, Butch teaches traditional tribal arts at United Tribes College in Bismarck, North Dakota. And he's one of the few people that teach that at a college level in the US. He keeps trying to retire, but they can't find anybody to replace him. So if you know of anybody, um, let them know, but he brought his students to the Peabody Museum for three summers in a row so that they could engage with um, some of our early collections. And that is the end of my remarks. Thank you for your attention. Well, I'm obviously going to throw out whatever I had to say and use this time as a rebuttal against Christian. Uh, actually, uh, you know, it's one of the great joys of this project has been the kind of ongoing discussion over the last three and a half years with so many leading scholars in the field. And um, there are still many, many questions that come up. And Christian, uh, I, I think I, this may be a shock, but I, I agree with him. I do, believe, I do believe the painting was done with the bird upside down, at least I think so. Um, there, are other, there are other issues around these early French robes. They can sort of be looked at in the round as opposed to a vertical orientation. 
And as, as part of my thinking in this, I, I took a, good, a large, good photograph of that robe and I hung it upside down in my office to look at every day. And the reason for doing that is that if, if you think about it, uh, when one is painting a hide, um, the stroke is a vertical stroke like this, drawing, drawing the line towards the body. And quite often in a painting, take a, take a contemporary abstract painting, you try and hang it upside down, uh, right side of it. You take one and you hang it upside down. There's a certain discomfort in that the sense of gravity um, is, is somehow misplaced. Uh, there's generally a kind of orientation that one feels a certain sense of comfort with. And also, in the nature of the stroke itself, you can sometimes determine where the artist was when that edge was being painted. And I could not come to a conclusion on this robe. I couldn't determine it. And in the end, uh, after lots of discussion with Christian, I decided to illustrate the robe the way it's always been illustrated for familiarity's sake, and then raise the question of the upside down image. Uh, there's another object that you will see in the exhibition uh, from a hundred years later. It's a Pawnee drum, and it depicts a great bird um, coming across the landscape with swallows flying in front of it. And the contemporary or the, the current feeling is that that painting also represents a great the bird is a thunderstorm, but the bird also drops down out of the sky. And I think it's a, uh, it's a concept that um, um, I think has been, been there for a long time. It's very logical if you think about it in terms of relating to the powers and forces of nature. Um, but it's, it's, you know, this was one of those questions, and there were many that came up through the course of this project that um, we've all grappled with in various ways. And that's one of the great reasons for doing a project like this. I, for my comments today, I decided that I wanted to, I wanted to talk about two objects that are associated with the artists, associated with the owners. Um, just to focus this point, I think that, I mean, you know, when, when I began in the field, uh, there was no, no real mention of artists in the literature, or even makers, hardly. Uh, Nancy Bloomberg, in, a, in her recent reinstallation at the Denver Art Museum, was quoted as saying that, that somehow there was the idea that, that Indian art just sort of bubbled up out of the culture. There was no connection with the individual genius, the individual uh, power of expression, uh, the fact that these were individual makers working within the milieu of their time and place. And uh, I think increasingly in scholarship over the last, um, certainly the last two to three decades, there's been an increasing search for the names of people that have made things or owned things or been associated with things because this does give us a sense of uh, the human part of these objects. They're, they're, they're more than just material culture. These things had a human connection, a profound human connection at the time of their creation, at the time of their use within the culture. And they still have the power to main that, maintain that connection uh, with people who have the privilege to see them today. Also, I've chosen two objects that are disseparate, in that one is a classic form and the other is unique, so far as I know. This, um, this, this robe that you're seeing now is uh, it's the same type that Christian mentioned earlier. It's called box and border. It's generally believed to be an abstract representation of the internal structure of a buffalo. And it's a classic women's robe. Um, it, um, uh, it was painted by a woman, uh, although these were sometimes worn by men, it is usually associated with the robe worn by 
uh, women, uh, particularly Lakota, uh, Central Plains women, especially Lakota, Arapaho, Cheyenne. Uh, this example is, um, in my view, the greatest that has come down to us. And it, it's one of those things where if you could see uh, 10 others, you would understand, I think, instantly why this is so uh, such a powerful and beautiful, wonderfully articulate painting. The compositional structure, the clarity of line, the clarity of color, um, the relationship of the painted design to the shape of the hide itself. I mean, one goes on and on, and this is a, it's a, it's an incredibly rich object and beautifully executed. Uh, it. Um, the remarkable thing about it, or one of the remarkable things, is that we actually have an image of the woman who was wearing it at the time that it was purchased by Maximilian at Fort Pier on the Missouri River in 1833. And it also seems likely that she was the artist. Her name is recorded as Woman of the Crow Nation, or Crow Woman. And we don't know if if she was, in actuality, a, a crow, a person of crow heritage that was, um, uh, at that time, living with, intermarried with the Lakota, or if the name comes from another place. But um, here she is. It's painted by Carl Bodmer, who was traveling with Maximilian and creating one of the great early uh, documented recordings of Plains peoples and their regalia, uh, as, well as, as well as landscape and the natural life, flora and fauna of the time. And this was pre-camera days, and um, uh, so Maximilian brought with him this young Swiss artist who was an extraordinary technician, of course, and, um, but also had something much more than that. You can count the triangles, and it's, it's the same. Maximilian um, lamented. He said she was able to buy, she was able, she was willing to sell me her robe. I could not get her dress. And she's wearing, as you can see at the bottom, what is quite likely um, uh, a side fold dress, which Castle just showed, or maybe it's a transitional version. But he, uh, she was unwilling to give up the dress, perhaps because it had so many trade materials connected with it. Uh, which were difficult to replace. This next work was done by a Meskwaki artist, a man named Wako Shashi, uh, around 1830. Uh, it has a curious history. It emerged about 25 years ago, was stuck in a volume belonging to George, Colonel George Davenport, who was the traitor to the Sauk and Meskwaki people in the 1830s and early 1840s. Uh, in his location, the post was where the town of uh, the city of Davenport, Iowa is today, the Tri-Cities. He was the first trader there, and we, we believe we know from the records that he and Wakoshashi were, were good friends. Um, when Davenport uh, died, rather tragically, in the 1840s, there's an article that was written uh, where the Meskwaki um, basically placed a gra traditional grave post on Davenport's grave and Wakoshashi um, uh, officiated in that ceremony and painted the post at that time. But this drawing, this drawing was discovered. It's certainly one of the earliest drawings on paper created by a Native American. It's executed with India ink. It was discovered in two separate sheets, although at one time these two sheets were joined by sealing wax. Um, we don't know the purpose of this drawing. We don't know, uh, even as, as I think about it, I don't know how, it, how the drawing proceeded. Uh, were the two sheets done individually? Because they certainly hold together in terms of their compositional structure. Uh, did one drawing begin and that at a certain point another sheet added and the drawing continued? Um, we just don't know. But the, the center point of each page is uh, a personal war narrative. Um, let me see. Here. Here. 
here the artist is shown at, at, at a moment of combat with enemies, but then beyond that, the pages are filled with almost every animal, bird, and fish that would have been known in his world in the Mississippi River Valley at that time. And so it's an amazing kind of document. Uh, someone who is a greater naturalist than I can look at this, I've been through this, uh, can look at this drawing and identify almost every single creature based on just the silhouette alone. There's that, that kind of uh, precision with regard to the characteristics of these animals. And there are other things about the drawing that uh, are mysterious and intriguing and we don't know because the oral history has not come down with it. But it, it is, I think, one of the great works in the exhibition. This is a portrait done by Bodmer also of Wakashashi when, um, when he and Maximilian met a delegation of Sock and Meskwaki who were in St. Louis in 1833. They had come down from their villages in eastern Iowa to try to negotiate the release of Black Hawk who was imprisoned at the barracks there. And uh, it, uh, Maximilian records that moment as saying, this is, these were the first true Native Americans that we have met because up to that time they were traveling in the eastern United States and um, uh, of course a lot of changes had impacted Native cultures uh, from, that, from the Mississippi on east. Uh, today at lunch we were talking about the idea, however, of, of purity, that uh, something is authentic <clears throat> you know, before a certain time and then inauthentic at another and of course that doesn't hold up. But Maximilian, even at this time, was regarding these people as wild and free and, in a sense, uh, pure, as opposed to other Native peoples he had met that had already been more involved with the impact of, of uh, Euro-American culture, but of course the Sock and Musquaki had as well. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I also would like to thank uh, Gaylord and all the members of the staff here, Nelson Atkins, that have helped to make arrangements and to work with us with regard to the catalog. Um, particularly want to thank Jennifer, who's, who's worked very hard in terms of trying to get these programs together. Well, I've been asked to speak today about uh, the role of women. And I think Gaylord alluded to the fact that so many of the objects in the collection, are, uh, it's difficult to determine exactly, you know, who the artists are because we're looking back at, a, you know, hundreds of years in the past. Unfortunately, when many of these items were collected, they were not always recorded very well, even by some of the ethnologists, in terms of, uh, of exactly um, who they were collected from. And it's always a great experience as a tribal person to be able to go into collections and to actually see objects that I can identify as Pawnee and actually know who the makers were in some cases. Um, well, the role of women, if you look at the, the exhibition altogether, um, I think at least 50%, if not more, of the objects probably were made by women because uh, so many of the objects represent um, excellence in artistry, beautiful objects, uh, many of which, or most of which also were functional. And today what I want to do, I'm going to just do an overview of about 10 objects and try to put them in perspective both from the artistic point of view as well as historical and cultural. So we'll probably move a little bit fast. Um, Again, I just wanted to make sure that we included a nice image of, of a couple of images of, of tribal people because I think people tend to forget that, um, particularly if you're coming in and, and um, the objects themselves are of such beauty, you could really get carried away with that without thinking so much about the people who, who made the objects. This woman is actually identified by the name Pretty Nose. It's a photograph that was made by L.A. Huffman in 1879 in Montana, she's Northern Cheyenne, and it's a part of, ser of a series of portraits of Northern Cheyenne people that uh, Huffman made during that time period. 
And we also need to take into consideration um, women's roles within the larger context of her family and her relatives. And this is a photograph that actually I was very pleased to see that it was in the catalog because it's always been one of my favorites of a Pawnee man um, with his child. And, uh, and look at that beautiful child. Um, and I love his hair. But um, anyway, this photograph was taken by William Henry Jackson in about in the 1860s, I think about 1865. And William Henry Jackson spent some time, a little time in Nebraska, and he's about the earliest photographer of Pawnee people. So we need to take into consideration the women's role with respect to her family, um, the men, uh, her elders uh, and the children, everybody had a significant role in terms of um, in terms of life on the plains. You have to think about cooperation. You have to think about collaboration as a part of life on the plains because it was necessary in order not only to survive but to also have um, a nice lifestyle uh, in terms of being able to uh, provide for the people and also to uh, experience the joy of artistry. Um, as you'll see in some of these objects. And I wanted to include a parflesh. Um, Gaylord probably knows more about this parflesh than I do. But it's, um, it's from the um, Southern Cheyenne, as I recall, but it's dated mid-19th century. And a parflesh, of course, is a very practical item that women made. Uh, it was, uh, they were generally made in pairs. And they're made out of um, pieces of, uh, of rawhide, oblong pieces of rawhide that are then folded together. In this case, in kind of an envelope design. But there are other types of, uh, of shapes that were used depending upon the objects that needed to be carried. I know there's a box, kind of a box one, that's in the exhibition as well. Um, the design here is, is, is relatively early. You just see a limited number of colors that are used with a wonderful rich green um, and the red, the black outlines. Women, of course, were responsible for making their own clothing. And this dress is a little bit um, more typical in terms of the shape of those that are found in museum collections um, dating, from the, dating from the 19th century. This one is also dated about mid-19th century as opposed to the side fold dress that, uh, that Castle showed a little while ago. Um, this is identified as uh, Lakota. I think it's a pretty typical Lakota design with a blue background um, with a U shape at the top. Um, the skirt is, is slightly flared, which was practical in terms of riding horses. Um, beautiful, beautiful hide work on this dress. The other thing that's significant about it is it is decorated um, in pony beads, which were the larger beads that were available on the plains through traders that were generally available up until, well, 1830s, 1850s. After you get out past 1850, you start seeing more and more beads that are uh, made out of the smaller seed beads. There were more colors available with the smaller beads and you could do more complicated designs with them. So once they became available, people started using them. And other, another item of women's clothing, basically these are called boots, but they're basically a pair of moccasins with the uh, leggings attached to them. Um, they're Comanche. You still see this style, although often not as elaborate, but you see this style at powwows down in Oklahoma among the Comanche and Kiowa people. Um, it's very Southern Plains. It was made in about the 1870s. You see the... Um, German silver buttons or spots along each leg. Um, the wonderful use of color from the, from the uh, kind of a, it's kind of a dark green, blue color that you see often on Southern Plains items. Um, I don't know if the, uh, if those are actual natural pigments, if those were pigments that were available from trade. I imagine available from trade from that time period. And women, of course, were also responsible for um, creating clothing and um, moccasins and things like that for their family members. So this is a pair of men's moccasins. And they're identified as Lakota from the mid-19th century. And maybe later on we could discuss with Emil and Arthur 
whether or not this is very typical Lakota, because when I first saw them, I thought Southern Plains. But um, you see the fringe at the, at the heel, and more unusual are the fringes that go all the way around the, the um, edge of the bottom of the moccasin with the porcupine quill work. And these are also pony beaded decorated. I was pleased to see a, Pawnee, a couple of Pawnee objects in the exhibition. And um, if you get the catalog and you read it, it talks about um, um, the possibility that these were not Pawnee, but they might have been Ponca because they were collected from Ponca people. Uh, they know who the collector is in the time period. Um, they're dated from around, um, I think they're dated at 1865. Um, I wish we had the, the picture of the other side of the leggings because I think that they're really interesting. And because of that, I would say Pawnee. Because on the other side, you actually have um, bear paw designs, you know, with the claws and everything. And that's seen very typically on Pawnee clothing. And uh, you see that also in numbers of historical photographs. In this case, we have again that dark green paint, um, beadwork strips, um, you have a painted hand. Let's see if I can use this up in here. You have um, the hair are bunches. There are bunches of human hair and horse hair. Um, in a sense, I would call this object very collaborative, and that the woman probably made the leggings for a male relative, but following uh, the idea of, or, or a vision that a man might have had in terms of how, what he wanted the leggings to look like. There's also an eagle feather on there too, isn't there? Well, you see how coordinated I am with this thing. Now this shirt is from the collections of the Plains Indian Museum and it is, uh, I guess it's somewhat famous in the world of Native American art. Um, we're very proud to have it in our museum. It's always very popular and, and uh, when we lent it to the show it was difficult to find something to put in its place that would be just as, well, it's not just as significant but would be not a letdown to our visitors. <laughs> and. Uh, this shirt was worn by Red Cloud, who was a famous Oglala leader. It's a very typical war leader's shirt. It has um, the strips on the shoulders, the beaded strips on the shoulders and on the sleeves. Um, it has the hair decorations. Once again, the hair is um, human hair and horse hair. And there's something like almost 280 bunches of hair on there. Somebody, not me, actually counted them. <laughs> I would never think to count them. But uh, anyway, um, and keep in mind, some sometimes people see these and they think, oh, those are all scalps. They're not scalps, they're bunches of hair. And they're hair that would have been contrib contributed by the man's female relatives and by supporters. Um, the shirt can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. Some people like to think, that the bunches of hairs has something to do with representation of his accomplishments in war, number of, of uh, coup that he may have accomplished. Other people, and this is the idea that I like, talk about the hair being representative of the people for which he's had responsibility, or he now has responsibility when he wears that shirt. Because although the individual would have been accomplished in war, he also was an accomplished leader in other arenas and peace as well. And of course, this is a, a very beautiful cradle uh, from the Dakota that's in the exhibition. Uh, it dates from around 1840. And it is, uh, again, representative of women's roles in terms of creating and taking care of, creating materials for and taking care of children but also the artistic accomplishments of women. In the same way that men could be honored for their war deeds or their leadership abilities, women were also, artists, were also honored as great artists and recognized in that, in that way. Um, totally decorated in porcupine quill work, 
the cradle provided not only physical protection for the child when the family traveled or when women were busy working, but also provided uh, spiritual protection. And there are a number of designs on there um, having to do with um, um, having to do with possibly Thunderbird designs. There may be some human figures, or they may be spiritual figures as well. And then um, from the practical point of view, you have things hanging on the part that kind of bows over the head, uh, little decorations to keep the child am amused while he or she is in the cradle. And I don't know why this appeals to me. This has turned out to be kind of my favorite object in the exhibition. I'd never really seen it before. And it is, again, an example of women's art um, or representative of women's art. And that women, in order to perform their art, had a certain number of tools that they used. And normally women wore these belts with uh, knife sheaths, uh, all cases, things like that on their belts, so they'd be right there, like a tool belt, right there ready to go when they needed it. Um, and you still see when you go to powwows again in Oklahoma, um, you still see women wearing these um, belts that have that same sort of significance in terms of their beaded pouches that are on the belt. But this one was made for a three-year-old child, and, <laughs> and it's tiny. And um, when I came back, when I went to the museum um, for the exhibition about a month ago, a woman came up to me, I was looking at this belt, and she said that she was going to go home and make one for her grandchild. And I was shocked. <laughs> but it is a wonderful work of showing um, Southern Plains art. Um, in addition to the, to the, you know, those kind of rectangular, let's see, pouches, which could have been used for ration ticket bags or um, could have been used for keeping fire making equipment or something like that. It has other things. It has the all case. It has this little natal charm here, um, representative of a lizard. It would be uh, a charm that would hold the uh, child's umbilical cord that she would keep for her life. And then there's all kinds of other decorations on it. And the more you look at it, the more things you see. So I hope that you'll spend some time looking at this piece here. Um, as women got into the, or as uh, the tribes got into the reservation period, you see women's art changing a little bit. Gaylord talked about um, um, uh, women's art and abstract designs and things like that. When they get into the, uh, starting in the transitional reservation period and then on, they start to produce objects that have more um, pictographic designs, uh, images of men actually in warfare that normally would have been a man's design if it had been painted. Uh, this shirt is from, or this jacket is from the Plains Indian Museum and again to see the front, front is incredible because it's covered front and back. Will all of these images, beaded images of men and horses and it dates kind of late, it's about the 1920s and uh, you can see it's a fitted jacket. It's a kind of jacket that Buffalo Bill or one of these Wild West showmen would have worn. Um, it could have been made by a woman for her Lakota relatives, or it could have been made for sale or trade. Again, showing the economic role of women. And if you look at this, this jacket, I've spent some time with it, and no two horses are alike. It's a wonderful range of designs. And then finally, Again, with a reservation period. I don't want to end on a downer, but um, when you're talking about the period of 1888 to 1899, I mean 1890, uh, tremendous changes had taken place within Plains Indian lives. People were on reservations. Um, Buffalo were gone. The um, freedom to, to travel was gone. A large number of people had died. And really, the tra traditional economies were pretty much destroyed. And so you have this, um, this movement called the Ghost Dance Movement that took place in 1889 and 90. Had to do with people returning to their traditional way of life. And then um, as a result of that, the, uh, all the bad things that had happened would kind of go away. That the white people would come back, 
I mean, would believe the white people would come, back, would leave, be gone, and their dead relatives would come back, and the animals would come back as well. And so, in terms of artistry, um, the women of this time period created these wonderful, wonderful dresses, and there are tribal differences in terms of what they look like. The ones that you see among the Lakota and the Northern Plains are very different from one like this, which is on the Southern Plains from the Southern Arapaho. And um, it was collected in Oklahoma. The Arapaho were very significant in the ghost dance movement. They tended to uh, kind of take the ceremony all over Oklahoma to other tribes uh, during that time period. Um, this dress, front and back, if you look at it, you could see it. To me, it represents the universe as a whole. You could see down at the bottom here where you have that kind of a blue color. I think you're talking here about the earth. And then you're talking about there are star designs on the other side. Uh, you have the, or, or there's also that uh, cross, which I, I tend to interpret as kind of a star design. Uh, you have the Thunderbird. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a uh, magpie. Uh, anyway, the birds that were considered to be messengers for heaven, to heaven, it's all painted. Uh, the people of the Southern Plains tended to use hide. They tended to use uh, pigments. The red pigment is considered to be a um, sacred color of the ghost dance. And they stayed away from trade items um, when they made this type of clothing. So it really looks at a, it really talks about a return to the, to the traditional ways. Um, and because this clothing helped people get through that very difficult time period, I guess in a way it's not really a downer. The clothing is not. So um, I think that ends my remarks. Thank you very much. One of the things that we, as, as Christian had mentioned previously, is that the field of Native American art studies uh, has been one that has uh, been a part of perpetual growth and evolution. From the earliest reportings of, of, and descriptions of objects into the very present, and the mo remarkable thing about this particular exhibition is that it accommodates uh, the range, the chronology of Native American art objects from pre-contact through uh, the, the contact period into the beginning of the reservation period, into the beginning of the 20th century, and it actually traces and continues into the, uh, the, the, the mid 20th century, the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And it actually features works that have been produced in the, uh, on the threshold of the 21st century. Now this is a remarkable achievement, a remarkable uh, uh, accomplishment. Because for a very long time, in the American world view, there was the stereotypical perception that once the reservations were established, that all the old authentic Indians were now dead. Anybody born into the reservation period or after that are somehow inauthentic because they are, are not real Indians. They did not really hunt buffalo. When in actuality, uh, one of the things this exhibition does is accommodates the evolution and change of Native American societies through a spectrum of changing events that brings us right into the contemporary period. Now for Native American people this is very significant because uh, uh, we realize as, as Native people that we are a part of a cultural continuum. 
We have grown up in multi-generational families. We, ha we had witnessed, well, for example, I was born in 1942, and that was the latter half of the first half of the last century. <laughs> anyway, there were still elderly people in 1940 who were born in 1850s 1859, 1860. In fact, I actually attended the, uh, 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 the, the funeral of Nicholas Black Elk, who was born in 1859. You know him from that famous book, Black Elk Speaks. I witnessed and actually helped carry flowers from the church behind the wagon that bore his, uh, his casket to the Catholic cemetery at Manderson, South Dakota. Not only that, but I had also witnessed other very, very elderly people who were born in pre-reservation times and lived into the mid-20th century. And for Native people, this is extremely significant because you grow up witnessing uh, people from ancient times, and then you, you also witness their offspring, your aunties and uncles and grandmothers, people who were born in 1890 and 1900, who continued the traditions, the artistic traditions, the aesthetic impulse as generated by their ancient pre-reservation relatives, and to be able to witness the products, the objects that were made, uh, uh, in this in this time, is uh, in, has been in need of verification, and that's one of the things Gaylord has done. And I thank you very much for conceptualizing this exhibition as one that treats the hi the historical and, and continuum into the present. And um, that being said, and having been a a former. Uh, Native American art professor and, and having an attitude about students, I would, uh, I would highly recommend that everyone in this room purchase a catalog to this exhibition because from our perspective the exhibition is the face and the catalog is the voice. And if you are truly interested in pursuing uh, knowledge about this, the, these kind, this, 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 this version of, in quotes, American art, that you inform yourselves well by buying the catalog and read what all these scholars have said about these objects because you're going to learn a heck of a lot more than listening to these five people up here. Yeah, it's a remarkable catalog and a remarkable exhibition. And to fill out your experience, I would certainly encourage, because in the text of the catalog and the illustrations, uh, you will become quite familiar with, in a sense, what these objects were made of, who made them. After all, it's during the reservation period, and that's my specialty, from 1870, the establishment of the reservations and the tribes moving on to the reservation. Different parts of the country, it was earlier. For example, in eastern South Dakota, the Yankton reservations were established by 18, 1851. And certainly, when you think about it, the great eastern, uh, the, 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 the re eastern removals, for example, the Cherokees, we're talking about 1830 to Oklahoma. And so it varies in different parts of the country. But for most of the Northern Plains tribes, 1870 is the pivotal point when the reservations were formally established. Now something happened from 1870 until about 1889. And that because uh, in 1889, we saw the, the Dawes Allotment Act, which meant that Native people then could move from little enclaves that they lived on for 20 years from 1870 until 1889. <laughs> uh, uh, they lived in small enclaves in different parts of these barren reservations. Uh, struggling to sometimes plant things and, uh, and have the drought destroy what was planted. And, uh, 
Anyway, we, but we saw many developments occur during the reservation that forever changes the Native American experience because it's a time of transition and adaptation to the non-Indian world that was ever pervasive around them. Education, technology, economics, habitation, that is living in a log house as opposed to a teepee, the changed economy from following the bison and hunting to living in one place in a wooden house, uh, sending your children to formal education, taking on the, traffic, the, the trappings and technology of becoming farmers and ranchers, uh, the influence of Christianity on Yuan's worldview also spelled rather dramatic change. So the reservation is a period, in a sense, that people survived and adapted and creatively synthesized what materials that became available, um, certainly, but the old traditions continued, quill work and uh, the proliferation of beadwork, and the fiber and fabric arts uh, began flourishing. As young people returned from boarding schools in the east in Car at Carlisle and Hampton, they brought new technologies, the use of the sewing machine to do applique and to do patchwork to produce the fine quilts that you all also see in the exhibit. Anyway, it was a time of dramatic and wonderful change, and uh, uh, the, the pieces that I have selected, I will, uh, whoops, I will try to, oh, here we go. In, in um, 1881, a man by the name of No Two Horns, who was a cousin of Sitting Bull, uh, returned from Canada with him and resided at Fort Buford and later at Standing Rock. And so by 1881, uh, certainly, uh, and he lived until 1942, and going through the process of, of living on his own allotment beginning in, in 1889, 1890. He, uh, uh, he was a part of uh, one of the developments that occurred on all reservations, which is actually the beginning of the modern art period, wherein we see what is known as the commodification of native art. That is, they are produced as commodities. That is, units of, or objects with artistic uh, treatments, some of them replicas of pre-reservation objects, which were made to be sold. In other words, people were beginning to make and, and sell beadwork and quill work at the local trading post as honorariums to clergy and doctors and, and non-Indian people who, who, who were assisting Indian people as gifts to visiting uh, uh, diplomats or government uh, representatives, uh, as distribution as gifts among those, uh, those people who were able, Indian people who were able to gather as a result of Episcopal and Catholic Congresses. Uh, anyway, the objects themselves become a necessity because the entire reservation culture is moving into a cash economy. In order to have food and kerosene for your lamps and, and fabrics and uh, harnesses uh, with, for your horses to pull your wagons, you need cash. And this gives rise then to a great proliferation of selling, making and selling things. Now while the intention of this particular piece stems from an ancient pre-reservation time of, of what we know as kill talks. Anyway, these were times when the warriors who had accomplished things with the aid of their horses or their buddies would get up on spe specific occasions, either when the remnants of warrior societies met to celebrate the old songs and dances, or perhaps right before the, the, the beginning of a sun dance or a simulated sun dance, it was customary that the chiefs or the elders, those who had experienced pre-reservation life, get up and talk about the time that they did this and did that and so forth. So it was probably very likely that no two horns who was born like in 1850, uh, 52, 
who had ex experienced the Battle of the Little Bighorn, huh? uh, the, the Custer defeat, and numerous probably other skirmishes, that he would stand up before the gathering of people, sing his personal warrior song, and, and, and paying homage in this song to his, his horse, holding this up uh, because it, it has, shows wounds that his horse suffered during the battle. And as he sung about the, the, uh, the honoring song that had been sung for him, he sang it for himself and in the process uh, inspired uh, other people uh, before him with his brave deed and, and the sacrifice of his horse. Indeed, there are stories from the, from the, from the, the uh, oral tradition that during the traditional sun dances, a warrior who had, uh, had uh, pledged before that he would sun dance if he was successful in battle. And if his horse played a role during that, his success, that indeed on the day of the sun dance when he was to perform and give back to the gods his own body through sacrifice, there's accounts of people, men, leading in their horses and standing and dancing beneath the sacred tree holding their favorite horse and, and, and having the horse recognized also as having assisted him. So this particular effigy, uh, uh, from all, from all uh, comparisons by Joseph Notuhorns, uh, would have been used potentially even at a sun dance in the, in, the, in the stomping of the grass ceremony where the people come in and do their warrior expositions and stamp down the grass. It might have even been carried in this ceremony uh, in, in honor of, 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 of his uh, favorite horse. I spoke of commodification where beating traditions change that is, native people during the reservation period, some of whom had attended schools as early as 1879 at the Hampton Institute in the East and later at Carlisle, uh, would return home and bring back new skills and approaches, including fashion, that is, uh, beating such things as opera capes and, and sunbonnets and uh, beaded high heel shoes and uh, they brought back numerous notions about, uh, about fashion and, and, and how these could be further adorned or in quotes Lakotaized, <laughs> Indianized. <laughs> Even parasols and umbrellas were sometimes elaborately decorated. And indeed, even the horn on an old gramophone, huh? with this quilled or beaded covering. And it was a dynamic time and an experimental time and a creative time. And this is the period when uh, Nellie Gates made this piece. She was born in 1854. She was the daughter of two bears on Standing Rock Reservation, I yanked an eye. And uh, she made this piece in 1903. It's done with, with a, the uh, non Western Sioux tradition of spot stitching. That is, a row of beads is laid out and then the thread is stitched down so that it, uh, you, do, uh, you, you, you can do these uh, uh, pictographic renderings, figurative uh, figures, because it was prior to this time, it was somewhat non-traditional for uh, an Indian woman to make figurative drawings. That was the man's realm. But by 1903, with education and a changed economy, people had time to sit about and do these things. And I might say this also, the mixed blood factor. Uh, Indians were marrying non-Indian, principally in Indian women marrying non-Indian men, originally fur traders. Anyway, th these unions become uh, more prolific as time goes on because pretty soon mixed bloods will only marry mixed bloods, you know. And uh, of course, if you were a mixed blood, you were bilingual. In fact, that's what Iesca means. It means interpreter. <laughs> so the first uh, mixed blood families were usually the the white men who knew native languages and worked as interpreters, and then they married Indian wives. And because they had more wealth, because of what they could do as a bilingual person, they, um, um, they became more wealthy. 
So in during the reservation period, their wives and their relatives and the wives' relatives could sit around and make more beadwork because they didn't have to work so hard. They had more resources. They could buy more beads at the trading post. And uh, so certain mixed blood families uh, became known at, by their names. Anyway, this particular, anyway, these are remarkable in that uh, her nephew did the drawings and then she proceeded to bead them in this meticulous beading stitch on the, on the, the bag and produce these remarkable uh, pieces of 20th, early 20th century beadwork expression. Here is a picture of, of Nellie Gates. And then a final one. This is, uh, this is a contemporary period, but it has to do with an event that occurred in 1990. Uh, Emma spoke of it as the ghost dance movement. And to be very brief about this, many of you are familiar with periodically, huh? These, uh, well, let's put it. They're, they're Christian fundamentalists who predict the end of the world is coming, huh? And, uh, uh, well, such an event happened in 1888, 89, and it culminated in 1890. Anyway, this, uh, this, this, this uh, Paiute man conceived of himself as being the Messiah, and he in, uh, somehow developed this view that the great millennium is coming to an end, and the great rapture is going to occur. Huh? And Indians had a part in this. They were going to, they had to dance and do this ghost dance and, and, and slip into the other world and see their relatives to see the world that is, it was about ready to become. And as Emma said, the white people were going to disappear, the bison were going to come back, and, uh, and life was going to just be hunky-dory as it was in the olden times. Just as those fundamentalist Christians convinced those same people to throw away or give their money to them <laughs> because the rapture is coming, you know. <laughs> well, it, that, uh, that, that's happened to white people. And you know there are people that believe that. And so there were Indian people who also believed that this was going to happen. Of course it didn't happen. And it ended very tragically at the massacre at Wounded Knee. Anyway, there is a, uh, in the catalog an exposition of this particular piece. It's a piece that I did, but it has all the elements. The uh, uh, part, uh, part of the, the vision was that Christianity was a blend of Christian and traditional beliefs, this great transformation that was to take place. Indian people were going to see Christ and God and the Father and, and their ancestors and everybody. Anyway, the major players, Kicking Bear, Short Bull, Wovoka, Sitting Bull, uh, the, the soldiers, the reformed 7th Cavalry was, uh, was, was there and, and, and created the dastardly deed. And uh, here's a poster advocating to sign up for the new formalized, uh, the new uh, reformed 7th Cavalry, which was the outfit that got defeated at the Little Bighorn. Here we have a, view, a photo, historic photograph of the, sun da uh, the, the ghost dancing as it occurred and the aftermath. And this is my photograph of the existing church where the bodies, where the wounded were taken to be healed. Around the perimeter is a reprint of the newspaper article describing the Battle of the Little Bighorn for it was known that the soldiers on the day of the massacre said, remember Custer, you know. <laughs> they were doing this to avenge Custer, to kill the 300 and so helpless uh, men, women, and children who had been disarmed previously. And so they're bought, they're, this is the interior of the current church, and these are views of the celebration of laying the monument. Uh, anyway, it's a, a descendant interpretation in contemporary materials and historic photographs and indigenous oops, indigenous pictographs. These are in the style of my great grandfather father, who was a traditional artist, these people, the ghost dancers, as they portrayed themselves. Um, with that then, 
I will terminate this, but and remember what I just said. Buy the catalog and become much more informed. <laughs>I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone here, Gaylord and especially Jennifer, because she's uh, kept me on track throughout this whole process. Um, so thank you. I get to talk about the contemporary artists today, so I'm very pleased about that. And also I'll be talking about the artists, the techniques, the meanings, and also the influences, which are either family, community, and today we often do research in museum collections to also incorporate into the pieces that we create. Uh, as Gaylord said, I'm a traditional artist. I do beadwork and I'm also a doll maker. Um, I also come from a family of uh, uh, powwow dancers. Uh, I am a northern traditional dancer. I'm not a great com competitor, but I can hold my own against these. Um, <laughs> And so I wanted to begin my talk with this. This is Jody Archambeau Gillette, and you will see her outfit in the collection. And Jody is what's known as a Northern women's traditional dancer. Now, the dress that she's wearing, about 20 years ago, you did not see um, this, uh, a lot of these fully beaded yoke dresses uh, because they were either sold off uh, put into museums or bought by collectors. But today, these, this is the standard northern traditional style. Now, I have to say this about Jody. Uh, she is from the Hunkpapa Lakota tribe in North Dakota. And I'm actually very proud of her as a Lakota woman. She has uh, great accomplishments. She is in 19, uh, 2012, she joined the White House staff as a senior policy advisor for Native American Affairs for uh, President Obama's Domestic Policy Council. And I believe she's still there today. Uh, I talked with her before she loaned the dress to the exhibition and she said while, uh, while she's doing this job, she, uh, she wasn't going to be dancing, so she would lend this to Gaylord for the exhibition. So, and also, I want to point, uh, Jody, uh, um, to complete the dress that Jody is wearing, um, well, let me back up here. One of the reasons I uh, curated a show called Identity by Design, uh, a Change Celebration in Women's Dresses, was to give the idea to let people know that what people wear identify who they are and where they come from, either from their family, from their community, from their tribe. And so this was one of the points we wanted to make, because today, uh, competition powwows are happening everywhere. Um, several weeks ago, I was out in Riverside, California, and there was a huge powwow at Morongo, California, in which a lot of the northern people, southern people went. And um, so we wanted to uh, explain that what you wear identifies who you are, and that you just don't put something on uh, and, and wear it. And so Jody had a lot of help in creating uh, her dress. Uh, her sister, Billy Hornbeck, and friends Iris Roulard and Robert Tiger Jr. actually helped her create this dress. It's made with what we call a Cheyenne pink background. And one of the reasons Jody did the Cheyenne pink was because she's also a descendant from, she had a Cheyenne relative. And so she wanted, so the pink is called Cheyenne pink. And so she wanted to uh, honor that relative by using that. But did, Jody designed this dress by using Adobe Illustrator uh, to help her work out the color combinations on this. And you can see that it is a fully beaded yoke dress <coughs> on the top. And the technique is what often referred to as lazy stitch, but believe me, there's nothing lazy about this. Uh, and it's, it actually follows <coughs> the quill work techniques of, of, of doing work by the row. Um, so if you look at this, it's all done by rows. Now, one of the really unique things about this dress is the skirt. The skirt on this dress 
uh, and was actually influenced, and I think I have it, by this, by the Bodner painting. And you can, if you look at the bottom of the dress there. Now Jody just carried that element this side and on the other side as well. So she was influenced by some early research that she had done. And actually, I was at a powwow recently, and I saw another northern traditional dancer that was wearing a similar skirt like this. So it's, it's, she's kind of influenced that style. And uh, you heard him talk about the, the sidefold dress before. Uh, this is our sidefold dress from the uh, National Museum of the American Indian. And this is actually how uh, it would have been uh, created from a large Example from a buffalo hide, how it would be folded and cut and wrapped to one side. Uh, Jody has also um, um, took uh, family memories and also family photographs to to embellish the rest of her uh, regalia here. Uh, the hair strings and the earrings here are all made out of dentilium shell. And one of the reasons she did this was that she had a great-great-grandmother named Striped Cloud, which, and uh, there was a photo taken by a very famous photographer from North Dakota named Frank Fitz, and he photographed that, and Jody saw the photo of her great-grandmother, and so that's why she created the hair ties on this particular piece. But Jody is known as one of the leading northern traditional style dancers. And uh, uh, the dress would have uh, uh, had to take at least one kilo of white f to do the border of the dress, and actually about six kilos of pink to, to do the rest of it. And uh, depending on how quickly you can bead, uh, it could do be up to a year or longer, uh, but she had some help with that. So. Uh, my next person I want to talk about is Rhonda Holy Bear. Uh, Rhonda is from the Cheyenne and Standing Rock, or Hunkpapa, North and South Dakota. And Rhonda today is one of the premier doll makers. And if you look at the, when you go into the exhibition, you'll see this, dre uh, this doll, which is about 30 inches high. And I've been viewing this. Uh, Rhonda and I was in Paris for the opening. We, I got to finally see this thing in person, and it's just phenomenal. Uh, Rhonda uh, is a great carver. The face is carved out of wood. And what she tried to depict on here, uh, and I got the name wrong, it's the last Lakota horse raid. Now, it was a very honorable thing for uh, a, a warrior to sneak into an enemy camp and raid their horses. Uh, this was a way of young men proving themselves. And also, so what Rhonda did on this dress is, um, I think, believe there's 24 horses that were raided from, a crow, from the Crow tribe, has six riders on it. And so this would have been a dress that a, a, a female relative would have worn to honor a male relative's war accomplishments. Now, one of the really unique things about um, the, and especially about the contemporary doll categories that we have today, is the size of beads that people are using. Now, I asked Rhonda, I said, what size beads did you use on this particular piece? And she said, a size 16. Today they use, now the, the higher the number, it's actually the smaller the bead. So contemporary doll makers are, are using beads that are size 18, 20, and 22. So they're, they're very small. And I'm at an age where I can't see anything beyond a size 16, so. Um, but Rhonda is known to be one of the, the premier doll makers. Uh, and she uh, rarely shows at competitions anymore because she has a clientele that they just commission her uh, to make pieces for them. And so she's really been turning out some phenomenal work. The next person I want to talk about is Jamie Okuma, who is a uh, Lasenio and Shoshone Bannock, who lives out in California right now. And uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Jamie had won her third best of show at the Southwest Indian Art Market. And her and Joyce Growing Thunder are the only two artists to ever have to have accomplished that feat. And Jody has been um, doing some really unique things, and I'll show you the piece that you need to see in the exhibition. I was blown away by this. 
and they're called uh, horseshoes. <laughs> and and um, actually, when Jody, the first pair I saw Jody make, uh, uh, Gaylord and I was judging an art show in Santa Fe, and I tried to get our director to go over and buy the shoes, and he had already secured them. So. <laughs> Uh, but this is a pair that uh, she just recently uh, made, and it won uh, a, a category at the um, at the herd market, and was bought by collectors. And uh, they're just really phenomenal. I don't, uh, and I think I saw the videos. And if you look at the video, you'll see how she's worked on these shoes, and it's really phenomenal how she's done it. And uh, there are precedents. Uh, the other shoes that you'll see in the exhibition, um, these are Lakota shoes. Uh, they were just something very unique. Uh, there are also traditions of beaded tennis shoes uh, that we've seen on the reservation. Now, there's a saying about Lakota bead workers, the women, they say that um, the Lakota women beaded everything that did not move. So. <laughs> Now this is Jody's late, I mean not Jody, uh, Jamie's latest pair that she just completed. Whoa. And I believe at Castle, these are at yours, right? Is that the Peabody? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and how she does it, I, I don't know, but I don't know if I want to know, uh, because I will, I'll be trying this, so. Uh, but she has uh, her combinations, her, her beadwork style, and she's really taken it to a whole new level. This is Joyce Groin Thunder Fogarty. She is, an, uh, as I say, she is also a, a, a highly prized winning artist. Uh, she won three best of shows at the Santa Fe Art Market. And this is one of her best of show pieces, and it's called Horse Medicine, uh, Horse Medicine Bag. And the design in here was from a petroglyph that uh, Joyce had seen from her reservation, and it represented the, the, the earthly and the spiritual world, and she's incorporated into the design. And she really keeps a wrap, I mean, a Cinnaboyne tradition, beadwork style designs alive in her work, and she's absolutely phenomenal. I, I, I don't know anybody else that has produced as much as she has. Um, she has passed this tradition on to her, her daughter. This is Juanita Growing Thunder. This is a quilled mask that you will see in the exhibition. Now, uh, Gaylord also told you I was doing an exhibition called A Song for the Horse Nation. Well, Juanita was finishing up this piece and she was gonna enter it in the, south, uh, the art market in Santa Fe. And I told her I wanted it. And she said, okay, if you want it, I'll give it to you. Uh, I'll, well, I'll sell it to you. But, um, <laughs> because I want it in your show on horses. And so she did. She, she uh, didn't do the competition because we wanted it. Now, she, um, this is all done with porcupine quill work. And uh, Juanita said that she woke up one night and she dreamt this horse mask. And what she did is she got up, she sketched sketched the design, and then went back to sleep. And she said she forgot about it for a while, and then later on she picked it up and she, uh, uh, she started to, to work on it. Uh, the designs represent the animal skins that, lend, that give themselves for our clothing, our shelter, our artwork, dragonflies. Also, there's a red and white alternating circles here, which represent that we live in the red and white world. And then also a path line down the center here. Um, it's a phenomenal piece uh, of quill work. And as I said, it's like many of the historic quill workers, the design was inspired through dreams. I'm gonna do this next one real quick. Oh, this is Juanita Joyce and uh, her daughter, Jessa Ray who was a, just recently a former Miss Indian World. And I want to show you, they're very proud of this, and it's the family jewels here. It's all the elk teeth. And you can only get two of those. They're in natural ivory, and they're very protective of these pieces. I, I was trying to get them from them, but. And 
So uh, we did not have a piece of Joyce's in our collection, and so we were able to commission this piece for the Identity by Design, uh, a fully beaded yoke dress um, to honor her grandparents, Ben and Josephine Greyhawk. And this design up here with the horse, with the bonnet, is what their grandparents used to do to honor the grandchildren. They would put a feather bonnet on a horse and then bring it out, as Arthur would describe, uh, out into the arena and doing an honoring song, and then they would turn it loose out of the arena. Now there were riders on horseback outside of the arena. Whoever caught this could have this horse. And so they wanted to show the generosity of their grandparents. So Joyce made the dress, and actually Juanita said, well, we, we want it to look right. So we will make the rest of the, uh, the accessories and donate it to the museum. And I told him, I said, no. I said, why don't you come up with a price and then we'll see if we can raise the money because this is how these ladies make their living today. And so Juanita made the breastplate here. It's all porcupine quill. There's a belt which has the accessories, the knife, the, the pouch, all on the back. And the granddaughter did the blanket strip here, which has horse tracks on it as well. And I only gave Joyce nine months to make this dress, and she did it. So, and it's one of our uh, uh, premier pieces. I'll end it here, so thank you. I'll just say that I felt badly about buying the shoes out from under Amo <laughs> until I saw the horse mask. <laughs> no more sympathy. Anyway, just to conclude today, uh, first of all, thank you all so much for your comments, your insights. It's been really great. Thank you for your, your attention. See the exhibition. And as Arthur says, buy a catalog. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are they not doing questions? Yeah. We took up too much time.